Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Rights and Responsible Data um, Working Group with the Godan uh, webinar series hosted by CTA. Uh, I hope you're all uh, doing well. Uh, we all know the difficult times with the virus. I hope you and your families are uh, well. Um, we are today going to have some kind of different uh, kind of webinar, uh, meaning we are hosting uh, four uh, presenters uh, to be we thought to be more uh, interactive this um, uh, webinar. Uh, so our uh, webinar is uh, about codes of conduct. Uh, it's something quite recent in uh, the last five years. Uh, and we thought it's good to discuss it um, uh, furthermore uh, because with the increase of uh, big data in smart farming, it is more essential than ever to focus on the ethical and legal aspects of data governance, meaning access control and consent and practices. Uh, this will provide valuable insights into how data is being collected and used and for what purposes, how to bridge the digital divide and how to create transparency in order to build trust between stakeholders. To ensure that the benefits of the digital revolution in agriculture reach everyone involved, especially farmers, there is a need to identify sustainable ways to support data sharing among uh, various stakeholders. Codes of conduct, voluntary guidelines and principles, as mentioned, on how to transparently govern farm data constitute an important first step to put some of the basic issues such as data ownership, data rights, data privacy, data security into an ethical framework and engage all stakeholders involved and mostly uh, farmers. So we have uh, today with us, as mentioned, four um, experts with uh, different uh, background and expertise. Uh, that they are going to shed light to the concept of codes of contact uh, and um, based on the three uh, questions that we have uh, given to them around codes of conduct. But without further do, uh, delay, uh, let me introduce them um, to you. So, um, Alice Namuli Blazevic uh, is a tech lawyer and partner tech and innovation at Katende, uh, Seth Pembwe and company advocates. She is an award winning lawyer, international speaker, and author. Alice specializes in technology and the law with a keen interest in artificial intelligence, blockchain, cryptocurrency, cyber law, and data protection. Also uh, with us uh, is Hamlus of Yesiga. Uh, Hamlus is a farmer, youth, ICT head and drone operator at IGTF Uganda. He has worked with smallholder farmers agribusinesses for over seven years implementing data for ag, ICT for ag and UAV for ag, meaning drones projects with uh, support from CTA, ACP EU, um, aiming at achieving SDGs goals through digitalization uh, of agriculture. Uh, also with us, uh, we have Dr. Um, Andres Ferreira. Dr. Andres Ferreira uh, is an electric and an electronic engineer graduated from the National University of Cordoba, Argentina. He also holds an MS in agrometeorology from the same university and a PhD in agricultural and biological engineering from the University of Florida. He has 30 years of work experience in academic, government and industry settings. His experience ranges from embedded systems design to remote sensing and image processing to mathematical simulation of crop growth and soil plant atmosphere interactions to automated design of uh, irrigation systems to enabling interoperability in digital agriculture. In uh, January 2019, Dr. Andres Ferreira took a data, uh, data asset manager role for the global digital agriculture team of Sigenda. 
at Connections Parent Company. His responsibility in Sigenda include leading development of Sigenda's global machine data integration platform and the semantic infrastructure that supports it, and leading Sigenda's participation in the Robert Boss um, GMPH organized networks consortium. Also, um, we have virtually uh, Stephen Kalinjubula. Uh, you will um, uh, hear from him uh, via, uh, via um, a video recording. Uh, Stephen is a certified computer engineer from uh, Makerere University, uh, Kampala uh, in Uganda, with four years experience in embedded system design, network engineering and software development. He is currently a strategic information systems officer at USAID, regional help integration to enhance services in northern Uganda. He also works as a project manager at Youths in Technology and Development Uganda, UTDEV, focusing on data for agriculture. He has actively conducted and participated in the series of CTAG FAR Golden Open Data webinars and conferences as a trainer and keynote presenter. He has also worked on, the number, on a number of digital agriculture related projects and participated in the publication of research papers in digital agriculture and remote uh, engineering. So, as mentioned, uh, this webinar uh, will be around uh, three basic questions. And the questions are um, the following. So, we are talking about codes of conduct, AG codes of conduct. The basic question is, therefore, what are uh, the AG codes of conduct? Then, and the second question is, what are the strengths, opportunities, and key challenges for farm data codes? And the third question, why a code of conduct in fair data sharing? How to develop a code of conduct addressing farmers' needs? So, we will start, as mentioned, uh, with Stephen's presentation. Uh, to, to see uh, what are his points and views around these questions, and then we will follow with uh, the rest of the uh, presenters. Welcome, my name is Stefan Kalesubra. I work for Youth in Technology and Development Uganda as a project manager. So, when we look at the firm data code of conduct, we know that Farms create lots of data, but farmers don't control where it ends up and uh, who can use it. Therefore, the codes of conduct looks at fair and equitable data sharing. As you can all see that we have lots of data streams. There's data on the farm exported and that is aggregated for further purposes and the one that is imported from our. But uh, here we are looking at localized data on the farm that is collected on a farm. So I know a few of you could be familiar with some of the cases of data being used in ways that go beyond consumer expectations. Just think of the previous Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. So we know that since most of the modern farms create a huge amount of data, for example, the types of crops that are grown, the crop yields, livestock numbers and locations, type of fertilizers and pesticides being used, soil types, rainfall and more. But farmers have very little control over the collection processes, the aggregation, the potential of them also distributing the same data. So, um, of course, this agricultural data is collected by the governments agribusiness and banks, and uh, it's regulated in a piecemeal fashion. Piecemeal fashion, it means something that is happening at a slow process, at a slow speed. Uh, it cannot be regulated or controlled or defined or neither any framework it uses. So it ends up beyond the reach of the very farmers uh, who generated the data. So, however, I've seen that there are signs that this may be starting to change by implementing the code of conduct. As you can see, the data flows from the farmers, probably collected from the farm, to the end consumers, who could be the aggregators, the processors. But there is 
a very small percentage of the benefits or the values that goes back to the farmers and that is the question of the farmers what do we benefit from so i'll be giving the farmers perspective therefore what are the challenges that the farmers are seeing in all this and probably related to data code of conduct um in one of the projects that we have worked with and uh, during the consultative survey and some of the projects uh, in Uganda that I've seen, for example, profiling of the farmers, most of the farmers have been telling us that there is little or nearly no trust in the technology providers uh, to maintain their privacy and not engage in the consolidated use of their data. That's why we have million applications online, but uh, they're not used by the farmers because of that trust. Okay, so and some of the farmers, of course, they were telling us drafting and applying the code of conduct, the structures on data sharing and the flow, it's a bit hard for them. And the question is that how to make it legal binding. And then three, literacy levels. We know that Sub-Saharan Africa, the greatest percentage of smallholder farmers are illiterate. And therefore, there is need to, for them to hire experts in the legal team or the technical team to unpack some of the terms that they could not be understanding. So, and some of them could be rated around data sharing, protocols and governance arrangements that are defined in the given uh, code of conduct. So, what do I see? What is the future in this code of conduct? I know what it can do is that it can regulate the piecemeal operations. Um, there is a strong future for digitally enabled agriculture that needs a, a data governance framework. Uh, others say that piecemeal just happens slowly and in stages that are not regular or planned properly. So agriculture needs a data governance framework. Guidelines must encompass the legal, the social and ethical rules. We need to protect the agriculture sector, the interests of the farmers and the farmer privacy. Therefore, um, if you look at the value and the benefits, this is what all the farmers ask uh, at the start of this entire process. What do we benefit? What is the value of this entire process of collecting the data and sharing? But if the code of conduct is there and is, it is institutionalized, the farmers cannot realize how to claim for their benefits or the value in the given process of sharing the data. I see that farmers are going to be placed in a position, uh, in a stronger position of fighting against and competitive practices. You know, some of the farmers are engaged in uh, local innovations or practices, and they create lots of local content on their farms. For example, I know a farmer who deals in passion food grafting and he, the, the way he cuts the stems and, and uh, puts them together, it's it's tricky. It's a it's lot of innovation that goes around. So therefore, if there is that framework that protects them in terms of sharing this data, for example, financial information or data from the, from the banks, these are just transactions, so the government can probably know how much to tax them. So once there is that code of conduct, that governs and protects the interests of the farmers. Uh, trust me, the farmers will be at a stronger position when they are claiming for their good uh, uh, practices or innovations. But what opportunity do the IEC, following the questions that the farmers have been asking us on how to implement it? Because if you look at, we have million number of uh, farmers organizations. If each every farming organization creates uh, a code of conduct we are going to have a duplication of sort but i was thinking that i know that most of the african countries especially in the farming communities or farming areas they normally they are normally under given umbrella for example the national farmers federation but now how how what can change how can it change if we say we strengthen this federation to see how they can institutionalize the firm code of conduct. I've seen this happening in uh, New Zealand whereby um,
they created a given uh, um, strategy or framework whereby the compliant organizations agree to disclose their practices and policies around data rights, the processing, sharing, storage and security. So if any organization wants to come probably to a given farmer's organization X and they need to do some data collection and probably provide a product to them, what happens that this organization, once it is compliant, they just present the accreditation mark. In other words, the farmers are going to see that, okay, now these people are accredited to this process, and now they go ahead to look at what is the purpose, why are you sharing this, what we need to share the data, and what is required. So all this creates trust because the farmers know that, okay, this organization is passing through a given level of um, implementation or a given level of um, of uh, accreditation so therefore this will tend to create more trust when the farmers are trying to figure out how to share and what to share but most of the farmers perspectives about the codes of conduct it has been on one the purpose they need to know the purpose they need to be notified uh, in time before the actual process happens the consent letter because they need to know the use, the access control, what level of rights they have on um, crude operations. Crude, I mean, uh, creating, reading, updating, and leading. At what level do they have to perform such operations? Um, it has to be precise and clear. And that is the contract. And the contract should demonstrate uh, the benefits and the value. They also say that we need to see attribution and recognition at any relevant level. For example, if um, in this process of collecting the data, maybe this project or this agribusiness firm is trying to improve or add value to what they're doing, and then at the end of the at the end of the day, if they come up with a product or a solution, there should be attribution or you should credit them in some way or probably provide certification schemes for them because you know they have created something new that has not been there before so that's what the farmers perceive or what they see the codes of conduct i should have so um in brief um what i see is that agriculture needs a data governance framework such guidelines must encompass the legal social and ethical so that we are in position to protect the agriculture sector, the interests of the farmers, and the farmer privacy. Of course, when we speak about code of conduct, most of the people rush to say, okay, we're speaking about privacy. But this is not all about privacy, but it's a broad thing. We are looking at uh, the, the, the level of promoting and uh, increasing productivity on a farm. So with that, uh, I feel that if our farmers are strengthened, if our farmers are equipped or um, empowered for them to know the, the value of, con of conduct, then we can have equitable and fair data sharing in the data ecosystem for farming. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think uh, Stephen has done a very good um, introduction uh, and not only an, an analysis around the uh, codes of conduct, what are farmers' concerns, uh, whether they feel they have control over they, they, their data or not, uh, issues of trust, uh, issues of um, literacy, and of course the need for a uh, data governance framework. Um, so Coming to, to Andres, uh, Andres, I would like to, to uh, start, um, how do you feel, uh, what are the Ag codes of conduct? When we are talking about codes of conduct in agriculture, how do you understand this term? How do you perceive the, uh, this? So, uh, <laughs> So what the Ag Codes of Conduct are, and I, I think it's important to first um, add a little context to this. Um, first, uh, I think no matter where you are in the world, 
a successful um, agribusiness understands that farming is based on relationships and trust. And, and that, um, that colors everything else. Um, but the, the, the truth is that uh, farmers' needs are getting progressively more complex. Um, there's new challenges like climate change and market volatility that, that make it really hard to farm now. Um, as if it wasn't hard enough before, it's getting even harder. And so there's a, a huge crowd of companies that um, want to provide tools and services to help those farmers um, meet those more complicated needs. But um, in order to do so, they require data um, of the kinds that Stephen so, so well described earlier. And um, given that complexity, things can go very wrong when you're collecting, using, and sharing data. Um, and, and that trust can be broken uh, very easily. So um, I, I think that codes of conduct are, are a tool and, and they're expressed as a set of principles, as, as a way of, of trying to make the subject more, more easy to understand. Um, that, that codify and, and, and try to simplify what trust looks like. You know, uh, let's think about um, how, how trust can be built and maintained and verified in the absence of pre-existing trust relationships. So if the vendor is, you know, married to your sister and you've known him all, all your life, um, uh, maybe this isn't such, such a big deal um, because that trust exists already. But um, in the absence of that pre-existing trust relationship, these codes of conduct provide us for, with a tool that shows um, what that relationship of trust looks like and, and how to reciprocate it. So um, the data consumer, you know, that service provider, wants to build and maintain the farmer's trust. And the data producer, that's a farmer in this case, wants that trust to be reciprocated in the form of loyalty and, and care. Um, and that's, that's how I see the codes, uh, Fotini. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Andres, uh, for, uh, providing, for providing us with uh, the definition of uh, our codes of conduct and highlighting that, of course, it is uh, firstly and basically a matter of uh, trust among uh, farmers, agribusinesses and ag tech providers. Um, um, Hamlus, could you give your perspective on uh, codes of conduct in uh, agriculture? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Hamlus. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, my, my, my connection was uh, a little bit lost, but I think it's restored. Yeah, thanks, Otini. Hi, everyone. Um, I will just uh, talk from the perspective of uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, I'm personally one, and um, uh, when we talk about uh, the agriculture codes of conduct, then um, I believe we are looking on different category of farmers and how these codes of conduct apply to respective categories. I'll, for instance, give um, a scenario for uh, our agribusiness, uh, that is Igara Growers Tea Factory, where the average acreage owned is about four to five. Um, when you look at the biggest percentage of these uh, farmers uh, who provide uh, this data uh, when being data correction, in most cases, um, they actually don't know what they are basically providing, uh, especially when uh, no little sensitization or no much sensitization is, is done to them. Um, a lot has been corrected from these farmers, uh, that is data or in terms of personal data and farm data. But when it comes into ownership and rights on this data, you find that a farmer is basically uh, left with no right because uh, this, 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 these are basically data that is um, aggregated, controlled by cooperatives, um, uh, by researchers, 
And at the time of taking other executable processes, they have no say and no right uh, on, 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 on their own actually data. Um, it would be really so good if, if a farmer is put in a rope on every stage of uh, processing uh, this data that belong to them because essentially should be the beneficiaries of the data provided um, uh, by them. And uh, uh, a few of the challenges that are them and who would further use the same data provided by the same farmers. And uh, from this perspective, uh, I would argue that at every point of the design, when we are going to farmers to have their data, we should truly communicate and elaborate on how important, how beneficial this data we are getting from these farmers uh, is going to benefit them, is going to help them. And at what point do they really come in and execute their own right? Should and who should not really get this data. And um, uh, one other thing is that um, uh, apparently most of the organizations have got much little uh, data about their own farmers. And this is such a big missing gap. Uh, I would really urge you to see uh, the involvement uh, that is at the national and the international regional level, uh, whereby there is that coordination in uh, putting up uh, the agriculture uh, codes of conduct uh, at, at um, organization, national and regional, then plus the international. Uh, on the level. Uh, give a scenario whereby in uh, most countries you'll find they actually have no uh, code of conduct in terms of the buy on, on personal data of rules to uh, to regulate and control. if you bring farmers on board uh, care for them, for them and when we basically disseminate this because we collect a lot of data from farmers uh, but very few of the researchers very few of the agribusinesses really revert or disseminate this uh, data back to the farmers I'll give a scenario of the recent project that um, we have been uh, working on that is the profiling and uh, your referencing of the farmers' gardens. You know, you go, you get data from the farmers, come execute, process, and do a lot of other things, report to the, 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 the donors, and you forget about the farmers. And this is the point when we are saying, no, look, we need to look at how basically can we build up this documentation back to the farmers, because it's important they know what is really happening on their farms. So my, my, my last argument here is um, when these code of conducts are put in place, then it becomes easy to involve farmers at the step of when we want to make this data open, when we have this data available for our partners that are coming basically to work with uh, uh, these farmers. All the farmers in this aspect. Uh, that's what I can say on the code of conduct uh, for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hamlus. Um, the connection um, at some point wasn't so good, but uh, still uh, we managed to understand what you are saying, that there is a need to bring farmers on board to the discussions with the agribusinesses, ag tech providers, uh, when developing a code of conduct, um, ensuring more farmers' rights uh, about who uh, has access and control over uh, data, uh, and um, also uh, the need for farmers to get 
back the benefits of data uh, sharing. That's very, very uh, important. Uh, thank you, Hamlus. And uh, going to Alice again. Um, Alice, uh, could you share with us your ideas about the uh, codes of conduct uh, in, in general? Um, what are your thoughts? What, what are my thoughts on uh, uh, code of conduct? Yeah. Well, from a, I guess my legal perspective, I just look at it like it's a pretty much a set of um, rules or guidelines um, by made, of course, voluntarily by a, a certain set of either individuals or members of an association or an industry. It all varies, but of course, in this particular case, it's a uh, in concern, it would be concerning governing data farmers. And um, w w w also, uh, why are we seeing an increase in a, in a, in a codes of conduct in a, uh, sorry, governing data for, for farmers? Where do we see this? Uh, why is there a very big, um, shift, I guess, from people or different associations, in particular farmers, yearning for mainstream legislation and reaching out for code of conduct. I think for me, this definitely stems from the fact that uh, there are so many existing, already existing regulations for data protection. If I give generally, um, on the African continent, we have, uh, I would say, now 27 countries with data protection laws. But you find that there's, there's still a lack of specific data protection laws that govern data flows in the farming industry. And because most of the laws are quite general and very few governments or regulators are willing to concentrate on this industry and coming up with specific regulations. So I guess then making it um, the next best option would be codes of conduct uh, to fill that gap, the legislative gap that uh, has been, oh sorry, to fill that gap between the existing legislation and um, the issues that farmers face on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, day -day basis when dealing with data. Th that's it. Thank you, thank you, Alice. Um, you mentioned uh, correctly that uh, worldwide uh, and in Africa specifically, uh, there is um, a legislation around data protection laws, but uh, there is no uh, regulation covering data flows in agriculture, and that's very, very correct. Hence, the need for uh, codes of conduct. That codes of conduct, of course, as you mentioned, um, they are um, not legally binding, they are uh, voluntary. Uh, yeah. And at this point, I would also like to add that um, we are having uh, three existing codes of conduct um, in, in agriculture. Uh, it's good to mention them uh, right now. It is the EU Code of Conduct on Agricultural Data Sharing by Contractual uh, Agreement that it was, um, they were developed uh, in 2018 by a group of um, uh, industries. Uh, also, in uh, 2014, uh, we have the USA Farm Bureau Privacy and Security Principles for uh, Farm Data. And uh, the same year, 2014, we have the New Zealand Farm Data Code of uh, Practice. Uh, this is an, an effort uh, of um, having um, and arranging best practices for uh, data management. Uh, and there are these codes of conduct have their strengths, opportunities, but also they do have some challenges. Therefore, I would like to ask um, Andres, um, what, Andres, in your opinion, are the strengths of codes of conduct, but also what are the challenges? Because a coin had, has also uh, has always uh, two sides. So I would like. Um, your uh, your thoughts on that what would you say are the strengths um, of uh, having and developing uh, farm data codes and what also are the challenges for that uh, regarding strengths um, i think a, a very 
very important one is that when you're comparing when you're comparing a code of conduct um, with a, a legally binding contract, um, the the code of conduct is a lot simpler, right? And that's important because, as as all the speakers have mentioned, um, it's it's important to communicate back to the to the farmer what they're getting into and what they're getting out of the whole process um, and how this works. So um, that simplicity is important. Um, uh, it it might it might not be sufficient, you know, because um, these codes of conduct are typically long and have multiple points. But um, but it's a lot simpler than a contract, especially a contract that is being is being made with with some intent to to hide things. Um, also, I think that these codes of conduct state shared values and commitments and that uh, explicit sharing of those values and 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 commitments can help strengthen and 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 build that relationship that the service provider and the and the farmer need to develop and and help uh, bring about that trust opportunities um, Sometimes there's new actors that come into an industry and they don't necessarily understand how that industry works. Um, I see it often in agriculture. We get people coming in from um, other domains, you know, these Silicon Valley startups, and they, they uh, don't necessarily know how this works um, at all. And the, and, and the clear role, the critical role that trust and, and those relationships have in, in making agriculture work. So codes provide new arrivals to the industry with a clear picture of, of expectations and best practices. Um, so uh, a good company in this space looks like this. You know, They respect the rights of the farmers, they respect the ownership of their data, um, they communicate clearly what's being done with the data and so forth. Um, also, in the particular case of self-regulatory codes, as opposed to the ones that require certification by a, by a third party, um, those self-regulatory codes remove barriers to entry into the industry. So a small new actor that wants to come and provide services um, can actually get in and do that. And, and so therefore it promotes innovation. Um, now I'll talk a little bit more about the flip side of that um, in the third slide. Um, so um, the challenges. Uh, first and foremost, enforcement, right? Uh, if you're dishonest, you can you can you know swear that you're going to abide by the code of conduct and and just not honor it. And that's always a problem. You can get a certification, you can get a you know, audited, and, but if you're really wanting to hide what you're doing, you're probably going to be able to get away with it. And that's, that's unfortunate. It's always a challenge. And, and, and there we need to um, rely on reputation in order to um, set things right. Um, another challenge uh, occurs when you bring a third party in. So let's say you're a service provider, you're um, you know, a professional uh, agronomist, you know how to provide services and support them with data. But um, there are some aspects of this, like taking um, some yield data and making a map of it, for example, that maybe you don't have um, that technology to do and you rely on a third party. It, this happens all the time. And um, it's hard to get that third party or to ensure that that third party is embracing uh, the code of conduct or that they have the same position towards data ethics that you do, right? Um, so that's an opportunity for dishonest actors. And we're back to the enforcement issue, right? Um, a third problem, which uh, we've seen happen with the, with the existing codes of conduct is adoption. Right, um, the value 
of of adoption is sometimes uncertain or there's there's some companies that might say uh this is incomplete this is you know necessary but not sufficient to be a good actor so i'm just not going to adopt this um so that's another problem um Another very large problem or challenge is that tension between making the code certifiable, you know, and a little bit more enforceable, and the costs and barriers. I, I mentioned before that if you have a self-regulatory code, that makes it easy to remove barriers to adoption or to, to enter the industry. But um, um, having a third party certify you. Um, like I think is the case in New Zealand uh, or, or in the um, Ag Data Transparency Evaluator in the US, that's great because you've, um, uh, you've had to present data to a, to a third party about how you are intending to run your business. But the problem is the cost. That, that's usually, that process is usually quite expensive especially now that there's um, very few companies that have done it. And, um, and that brings a very big challenge to adoption by the small companies. So if you have a situation where you have a certification process and you have to pay for it, what ends up happening is that only the big powerful companies get to do it. And that, um, that's counterproductive. And the final challenge is, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, you have to keep it simple. So um, the the shorter and clearer the code, um, the more everybody can understand it and set their expectations accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Andres. Uh, you actually um, summarized I uh, would say uh, everything uh, with this slide around the strengths and the challenges of um, farm data codes. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I would like to also hear from um, Alice uh, if she has something to comment on, on what Andres mentioned or add something. Um, I, I think the uh, code of conduct are powerful tools for cosplay power farmers to be <clears throat> to um, transact in a more transparent way because or the industry is uh, the small farmers or the small business uh, owners they are always um, they always feel left out uh, because things are just never very clear and never simplified. Everything is too complex, the contracts are too complex and all that. But um, the simplicity of uh, uh, codes of conduct make it uh, much easier for um, so many farmers to participate. And they feel like uh, they are well represented and they are all, uh, it makes them also be able to um, voluntarily share data easily. Um, apart from empowering farmers, I, <clears throat> I also believe that uh, Codes of conduct are a great space to address specific challenges, you know, to the minute detail of any industry. So in specifically, of course, uh, this is for data for farmers. You'll find that uh, all the data protection laws we have on the African continent, like I mentioned earlier, don't go into specifics, but not only um, data protection laws, many laws are quite general. They don't uh, deal with the specifics. So I find that um, uh, codes of conduct are able to address you know, those specific challenges of an industry. And I think they've done very well um, in this space. Um, another strength, I would think, is uh, awareness of uh, data rights for farmers. This is uh, quite um, uh, complex because you find, especially on, Afri on the African continent, many farmers are kind of illiterate. So they don't know right from, they can't even be able to uh, read and write. So 
how would they even be able to understand the regulations that uh, govern their industry? But then when you have these kind of simplified uh, regulations or principles that govern, that would govern them, it, um, they're able to understand at least um, in very simple terms their rights. What are their rights? What are their obligations? What are they supposed to do? And then it actually also helps them to willingly uh, participate when it comes to data sharing. But the most important thing is that at least they are aware of what their data rights are. Then I also think uh, the, uh, the codes of conduct uh, increase collaboration and inclusiveness of all stakeholders in the agribusiness uh, chain because you, you for, for, for a set uh, one industry or members or an association to come up with codes of conduct, there must be some kind of a, a collaboration on, by all parties. All parties, their voices should be heard, their interests should be taken into consideration. So many farmers feel uh, like they've not been left out, as opposed to some of those which are drafted somewhere and then, you know, they on them. So this kind of collaboration and inclusiveness uh, also may help them to speak and just to work together. It also ends up breeding more um, strong cooperatives within the agriculture sector, which also helps them to work together, come up in, in case they have to uh, determine, like, let me say, prices, and in case they have to negotiate, you know, as, as a group, it definitely becomes a um, very powerful platform. Because they, they feel, farmers, I feel, they gain a higher bargaining power whenever they, they are transacting or signing contracts uh, for data sharing. I think that's it with the, with the strengths, opportunities, then the challenges. Um, I think the major one would be, they, there's usually some kind of conflict between the codes of conduct and the existing le legislation. It happens because it also happens in, with mainstream leg uh, uh, regulations where you have uh, one law contradicting with another law or regulation. So that happens. But here, the fact that it's voluntary, if it, if it contradicts and it's not illegal outside the law, then you as the members who find it voluntarily can adhere to it and you know, impo impose it or implement it. But uh, in many cases, we find that uh, it's very easy to, to, to have a conflict between um, uh, the existing laws and the codes of conduct. Then um, the lack of compliance, I think someone mentioned it. I would say if there's lack of compliance, that's one uh, from, of course, the members that who have signed it. This is a very common thing, <laughs> again, on the African continent. We have a very poor culture of compliance, not only with codes of conduct, like in many spaces where we are supposed to comply and follow things through. So it's very easy for people um, who like an association to come up with uh, something theoretical on paper, but if the members complying, it's something uh, completely different and <clears throat> becomes a very, very big challenge <clears throat> to implementation of the codes of conduct. Um, then enforcement, I think they can also go and hand in hand, just in case, of course, if the members fail to don't comply, then how do you enforce? Uh, the, again, for me, I also look at it that this is not an isolated uh, problem. We generally also have a very poor enforcement culture with our mainstream uh, legislation. So I would, that usually those kind of things, tie, they're kind of tied in. It's, it's, if you have an enforcement culture where things are just never enforced, you know very well that you go scot free if you don't comply, then you end up having a, 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 what we call a laissez-faire culture. Um, then the other one is a lack of cohesion or collaboration among the various stakeholders because usually you have the big businesses uh, and then of course you have the small stake, uh, farmers. In there, you find that um, the people, some of these people who are um, fully 
into uh, big businesses. They don't want to, how can I say, um, like find a middle ground. So it becomes very difficult for the, especially the small, the small old farmers, old farmers, to to feel that there's some kind that their interests actually are taken care of. So because of that, you you end up, you know, uh, experiencing very low compliance levels because the big businesses, sorry, the smallholder farmers always be, feel that the big businesses um, want to take advantage of them. So they're like, okay, let's let's sign this paper and document, but uh, at the end of the day, um, we are not on the same, I guess, platform. You guys most probably make so much out of our data and all that. That usually comes up a lot, and we've seen that. Then the lastly is uh, there's a lack of global standards. I think def we definitely need to have standards for various situations. Another thing is the same as uh, uh, another association next door, but also contradiction with uh, one jurisdiction contradicting completely <coughs> co contradicting with another jurisdiction. So I think there should be some kind of harmonization of these uh, codes of conduct, where we have like let me say an international standard where we all look at and say, okay, this we rather we benchmark that um, there's some kind of, um, uh, like I would say, harmony between uh, these uh, these codes of conduct. Um, I think that's it, all I have to say yeah. about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alice. Uh, that's a good suggestion, the last one about uh, harmonization of standards, global standards. Uh, still, I'm not sure if we are at this time on the level of uh, um, having that. Uh, it's a good suggestion, but I think we are um, still uh, at, the, at the beginning, but uh, <laughs> it's a good, a good, a good idea. Uh, I, so we heard um, Andres from uh, the industry, we had your uh, legal uh, perspective, Alice. I would like also to hear um, farmers' perspective um, around the strengths and um, opportunities and challenges of cause of contact from uh, Hamlus. Uh, you mentioned some of them at the beginning, if you just summarize them and Afterwards, we could um, go to the last uh, the last part. But Hamlus, could you mention some strengths and challenges for that uh, farmers deal uh, with uh, the idea of having codes of contact? You mentioned uh, uh, literacy issues, uh, the lack of trust. Um, would you like to comment? Yeah. Well, thank you, Fortini. Um uh, my, my 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 biggest argument here is um, uh, for those for those uh, organizations or agribusinesses having the codes of conduct uh, about the farmers' data or the guidance uh, the guidelines and privacy and pro protection guidelines. Um, Really, it creates a lot of trust between uh, the operators and the partners and the farmer themselves because they feel they have that power, that urge of saying, oh, I, I, I can say this, I have a right on this, I can withdraw this. So it's really very, very important. But also we need to look at the, uh, the dimension of who this farmer is because uh, like I earlier said, it, the design of these codes of conduct are really very important. Uh, like Alice is saying, is that conflicting uh, of the agribusiness guidelines uh, on, on, on privacy and data protection with the national bylaws on data protection. So this has to be harmonized relating on who are these uh, farmers, the, the, the class of the farmers. Um, the other thing is um, uh, the strengths with the uh, codes of conduct is uh, the 
the, the, normally when it is in existence, they, that smooth movement, especially when you are a data creator, when you are a data processor, and then when you are actually doing even the dissemination, they will feel that, uh, that strength for themselves. Um, a few of the opportunities basically is that uh, for, 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 for those agribusinesses that have the guidelines and uh, the rights uh, in existence, I believe uh, most of the transactions are very uh, smooth uh, with the partners. Uh, I'll give a scenario for Igara, whereby uh, most of our donors are asking for the same. Uh, you have uh, uh, the data protection uh, guidelines in place uh, for you. Uh, to help us do ABC for the farmers, uh, and that would be very good opportunities for the farmers. Uh, the biggest of the challenges, um, basically, like I was saying, is that conflicting adoption, like Andre is saying, is is the biggest challenge. Uh, it's 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 one of the complex challenge. Uh, people will come, they will say, "Oh, yeah, look, we buy that, we buy this. Uh, this is very good for us." But putting putting it in place. And having it work for the farmers uh, is always very difficult. Yeah. Hey, thank you, thank you, Hamlus. Um, so to to summarize, uh, um, the strengths of codes of conduct is that uh, uh, they do set light and transparency on how farm data is being governed. Uh, also, they enhance uh, trust, uh, inclusiveness, so more stakeholders get engaged to the discussions. Uh, farmers are more aware of their rights. Uh, who owns data, who has access and control over data. There is awareness uh, around that. Uh, and um, also, I would say that uh, they contribute to a change of behavior and attitude of um, agribusinesses, meaning how data is being controlled and uh, shared. Um, so these are uh, the, the strengths and the opportunities of developing a code of conduct uh, but from the other part uh, the challenges is um, like Alice um, mentioned that there could be a conflict with existing uh, legislation they could over, uh, overlap uh, and also Andres mentioned about the issues of um, uh, enforcement uh, what about certification schemes or another question would be who is in position, uh, in the best position to design, implement, and administer these codes of conduct. So just mentioning all that uh, comes the final question. Why? Hey, Stephen, yeah. Stephen, yes. Stephen's on board. He, he oh, Stephen made it. Perfect. Stephen, welcome. Yes, uh, thank you for, for Tini. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'd like to, to give in a few comments uh, regarding the strengths and opportunities. Yes, please. Uh, yes. Concerning the farm. Yeah. Um, I'll give a, a real scenario, scenario of what is happening in the country here uh, in one of the projects we have been doing with some young farmers. Uh, I remember when uh, we were starting a project on yogurt production in Western Uganda, and uh, these young farmers wanted to make uh, yogurt uh, from di of different flavors, like from lemongrass and all that beetroot. But now they found a challenge of protecting that innovation because it had uh, lots of nutrition data involved and uh, the processing data involved. So they posed a question that, how do we move forward? How do we get started with all this? And you know, there are a couple of researchers coming on their farms to do data collection and research and all that. And they were not sure whether someone could duplicate that innovation. So what am I saying is that uh, issues concerning uh, having the codes of conduct to be combining are a bit hectic. And uh, I feel that most of the smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa, their, their structures and they are weak in the sense that even today, interpreting the laws and articles concerning land rights, it's a problem. You find a farmer is a, is, is, is a very big farmer, but interpreting the laws concerning land ownership and uh, market tax laws, it's, it's hectic. 
So what I've seen, uh, things that have worked out in some countries is that most of the countries have federations. For example, here we have the Uganda National Farmers Federation. If we strengthen, because I'm thinking that if we say every farmer or farmers organization comes up with that code of conduct, just imagine it will be hectic for everyone who comes to that farm to subscribe to them or to abide by what they say in the code of conduct. And just imagine if probably those farmers organizations want to push it push their codes of conduct to be legal binding. Just, I'm just imagining the hectic, the, the struggle that the courts are going to face in the what to pass and not what to pass. So what I think is that when we strengthen the, the national farmers federations and they design a given uh, code of conduct concerning data sharing and the use and you and uh, this code of conduct probably because that federation has a bigger say and they try to push it to the low people and they make it look binding so that way it will create some bit of strength and they, they, they going to, they, there's going to be a bit of strength in the farmer structures i've seen this working in the in the new stand whereby they have a portal whereby any organization that wants to do data extraction and processing from different farms, they have to apply for certification and they're accredited. So once they're accredited, then they, that organization that is compliant for, to that code of conduct, they just present it to the farmers organization that, hey, here we are, we want to do X and X, X on your farm. Uh, this is the, the flow, this is what you want to do, this is the scope of the benefits and the value that we're going to give you. What do you say about it? Then they sign again and state. So once we have something like that, I feel like it's going to move on well because I see that the opportunity in codes of conduct is going to put the farmer in a stronger position to compete uh, over different uh, competitions and innovations that they normally face. Yeah, that's the, the small comment I wanted to make uh, on the farm data code of conduct. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so coming to the final question, because uh, we talked about the strengths, but also about the challenges. Uh, there are quite a few challenges that uh, we need to overcome. Uh, so the final question, and I would say the crucial question is why then a code of conduct uh, in fair data sharing and how to develop a code of conduct addressing farmers' needs. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, are you in favor of um, developing a code of conduct based on everything we discussed and based on what really exists um, worldwide? Uh, is it good? Uh, is it a good tool to uh, breed, let's say, the legislator void at this point? Uh, or um, what do we need to do uh, with certification schemes and enforcement? So what are your thoughts? Um, Andres, would you like to, to answer first? Uh, sure. <clears throat> when, when you sent this question, of a you know code of conduct and fair data sharing, um, my mind sort of wandered uh, along the lines of what Alice was talking about um, earlier, of uh, something with a bigger scope, you know, maybe multiple countries, uh, that harmonization in 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 multiple places. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a code of conduct that it sees widespread um, has a widespread scope. I think would from a farmer's perspective um, would lead to simpler interactions so less having to figure out what a contract means and and the those trust relationships can can be adopted um, or developed more quickly um, when uh, people are trying to develop digital agriculture solutions for farmers to use um, for a large company like the one that that i work for um, having uh, an internationally scoped code of conduct could simplify 
um, the scalable deployment of um, those digital agriculture solutions and the messaging around them, right? Because this would all work more or less the same everywhere. That would be great for a large company. For a small company, um, having a recognized code of conduct um, and ad adhering clearly to it would conceivably kickstart that trust with the farmer. If you're if you're new to the game and you know you you can come in with that flag, um, maybe that can help you. I'm not sure, um, but but I would like to believe that that um, that that would help. You know, like a, that that seal of approval, right? But um, getting that seal um, has its problems, and I'll, I'll revisit that in a moment. So. Going on to how to do this. Well, first of all, and echoing echoing things that um, that the other speakers have said, farmers associations need to be very heavily involved, and and not one at a time, not each doing their own thing, um, like was mentioned earlier, but actually together. I was I was involved in the process of. Um, coming up with the ag data transparency evaluation tool here in the us that um that establishes that certification process for um the the code of conduct that the farm bureau federation uh, set up that fotini mentioned earlier and um all the major farmers associations were involved and and that was really great it, it was um, it helped clarify the messaging. It, it helped really give give the effort um, uh, weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, although at times um, it was challenging because one federation might uh, take um, something one way, another might take it another way, just the process of working our way to a consensus was worth it. Um, I think everybody came out uh, enriched from that process. Um, a second one, which um, I'm concerned about, is that yes, it's it's great. Um, uh, like Stephen just mentioned, if if there can be a certification process, and it's even better if there can be enforcement of these things. But uh, the only way in which that can happen, in my mind. Is if you have an independent funding source for it, because self-funded certification programs will inevitably favor the larger companies and create a barrier to participation for smaller service providers. Um, even even if you can think that you know the size of the opportunity um, might be a lot bigger than the cost of of certification, just that. Um, Putting a value on on that opportunity is still very uncertain. So knowing how much is it worth to get this certification is not a question that we can answer very clearly right now. Um, another challenge again is keeping this simple, you know, and um, uh, that can be difficult. And finally. Um, uh, Stephen mentioned at the beginning, you know, that a lot of this happens in a sort of piecemeal way, right? Um, and and I think his intention there was saying, look, there's multiple places where um, uh, data is uh, is collected. There's there's multiple points of of uh, opportunity to collect data and use it. And um, I think that that Hamless mentioned that. Um, we need to be telling the farmer what's what the data of each point is being used for, but we we shouldn't think that you know this idea of you know a disperse um, uh, sort of piecemeal nature of data collection means that we need to take a piecemeal approach to designing these systems. Um, so what I advocate for is that uh, is is that we um, follow a data ethics by design approach, which means that if I'm making software, if I'm making a, a, a process for, for advising uh, farmers or, or a tool of any sort, that um, 
the, the underlying principles of, of data ethics that we're guiding ourselves by, in this case, you know, talking about codes of conduct, need to inform every single step of the way. It, it, it can't be an afterthought that we sort of bolt onto the process that we've built, but instead, um, if, if there's a software development stage, if there's a service design stage, if there's you know, implementation and support and so forth, at each little step of the way, we need to be mindful of that code of conduct and what it um, is expecting us to do and make sure that our processes um, internally as an organization that's providing services uh, reflect those uh, those codes of conduct. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andres, uh, so much. Uh, okay, let's um, ask Stephen. Stephen, are you with us? Stephen, um, your yes, thoughts? Yes, I muted myself. Okay, okay, uh, no worries. So your thoughts about why having a code of conduct and how to develop one, uh, focusing more on uh, farmers' needs, since the existing ones uh, are uh, basically from uh, the industry uh, perspective. So how can we ensure farmers are being more involved in the discussions of codes of conduct? Uh, thank you, uh, Fortini, for, for that. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak to the farmer because I'm a farmer. Why do we need the code of conduct? It's only one point to me as a farmer. I want to see to improve the position of the farmers against anti competitive practices. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I've seen this happen in my community where innovative young farmers are trying to come up with interesting innovation to add to the, to the harvest of the things that are in the garden and it has been a challenge whereby multiple industry experts or academias come to the farm they try to do interviews you know they extract lots of data from the farm and you find that they have duplicated somewhere so that is my strongest point me as a farmer that's what i want to see the code of conduct help me to improve or to position me why i have big say on, the, on my data however i earlier said the uh, uh, rights on data vary according to levels of access and education processes so most of the farmers or the farming organization may not realize that. But uh, I think from what uh, actually Andres said that uh, if the technical team can really unpack uh, the levels of uh, access because they vary at any point of aggregation, so that will be helpful for these farmers. So how do we develop the code of conduct? Um, I'm not so much deviate from my uh, the most important thing is to have the farmers at the center of design because I also say that if we say okay let all the farmers or farming organizations come up each one designs that code of conduct trust me we shall have lots of duplication in that space and uh, even it will create sort of a hinder different people who may come to meet the farmers to see how they can add value or give them more um, uh, data-driven solutions to on the farm. So um, I feel that if we the farmers are put at the center of all this uh, together with different and legal experts and uh, they can help us you know better this code of conduct that all the partners can subscribe to. Uh, uh, the, the on farm data, yes, uh, you know, it also involves some other policies like land. You know, I can't just release the size of my land like that, or who owns it, what are the square miles, you know, that is sensitive information. So we need to factor in different policies that can influence uh, the code of conduct that we want to design. So, um, the other point that uh, Andres actually hinted about was about 
you know, we, we need to, to capture also the data ethics aspect in this code of conduct because it explains the process, who has rights at what level, you know, the core purpose why someone is collecting that data, who's negatively affected, and this entire process of collecting extraction and processing, are they trying to communicate potential risks and issues? And if any, they should be disclosed so, so that uh, the partners can get to know. Uh, and maybe the limitation of what the um, maybe the policies and laws that can shape the use and the dissemination and distribution. And maybe the most important thing that uh, the farmers want to see is that, you know, there is unfair, there is unfair flow of the data because most of the people come and extract, but what is a very small, is a very small percentage. So they need to understand the, the core purpose. What is the purpose, the value, the feedback, the benefits, you know, when, to me as a farmer on my farm and give me a product probably you're collecting data for how much i produce how much i sell and all that once i realize that you're not adding value to me trust me i just won't abandon your operation or your business service so me as a farmer i want to see that coming coming out clearly probably coming out the, the, the code of conduct clearly states the core purpose of their process and then the other thing is that uh, in all this, of course, we are trying to minimize the negative impact because we know along the way a couple of partners will be affected along the way. Uh, so that is how I perceive uh, why and uh, how it should be developed. But just to conclude, uh, I think that when we use the existing structures, uh, we may not create current structures, but we existing structures of these farmers' federations, and we clearly engage them and we come up with a, a sample code of conduct that guide and um, all these farmers' organizations, probably business experts or innovators who are bringing innovations to the farm. Uh, trust me, we shall have some bit of uniqueness. And once that is provided, maybe and we try to push so that probably the government can make it legal and everyone, you know, subscribes to it just like what is happening with that. Where various organizations are, present, are presenting the maps, they show that really we are legible to, to do this kind of work. So I say that the farmers are going to be in a stronger position now. We are going to see a couple of productivity levels increasing because we shall have more farmers protected in this data ecosystem. That's what I think. Uh, for Thank you, thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, Hamlus, your uh, comment on uh, having uh, codes of conduct, the necessity of, of having codes of conduct at this point, at least. Yeah, thank you. Um, of, recent, of, of, of recent, I had a very, uh, not a very fair code of conduct for my uh, data sharing, and people have taken advantage of uh, sharing too much and not knowing what will happen eventually. So I was imagining if we share too much on behalf of these farmers because we don't have um, uh, their rights uh, or we don't have the code of conduct uh, for sharing this data, then uh, some people will be taking advantage of them. Uh, I think it's important and, um, and, uh, and, and, and very challenging uh, to have a fair data sharing upon the right of, of, of the farmer, not uh, on, on the right of, of the data processor. And um, how do we come up with this uh, uh, code of conduct uh, addressing the farmer's needs? I've seen it uh, for so many times whereby uh, problem solvers uh, just come with their solutions, but they are not considering factors on what they will basically solve. Um, for several uh, scenarios, we've we've seen people trying to solve problems of farmers, but they don't know exactly what these farmers are facing. I will give a scenario of uh, myself, whereby uh, if, if you look at the imagery um, uh, processing uh, or the drone uh, uh, images that are basically captured on the uh, uh, gardens of uh, these farmers, there's no way it is documented in, in terms of um, uh, data protection. 
and, and sometimes you're a little bit confused, where does this really uh, fall? So my argument is um, uh, we need to look at um, all parties uh, coming together, putting up these uh, codes of conduct uh, for addressing needs for the farmers. Uh, we need um, experts here, we need a farmer, we need these uh, smallholder farmers, uh, we need the service providers in here so that it is very well aggregated. And uh, like uh, Stephen Ali said, if this is done at uh, the agribusiness level, then it will also be very, very quite challenging and not fair for the entire uh, nation or, or at uh, the regional level. So I still insist on um, uh, putting efforts and much emphasis on, 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 on Farmers uh, Federation uh, Association at the regional level. Uh, that would be more valuable in helping or uh, addressing uh, the needs uh, of farmers when it comes to code of conduct, uh, trying to help much of, of, of their needs. Um, I think that's, that's what I can say here for Tini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, because we don't have so much time, but still, I would like to um, address some questions of the participants. Uh, so one question from Moraba Adams is uh, what uh, should be the government's role in ensuring a code of contact, um, meaning how it would, could be developed? I think Stephen mentioned something earlier about government's role, but uh, if um, Andres and Hamlus would like to comment on that, government's role for uh, codes of conduct? Um, Amos, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, surely, when you look at um, uh, the way these governments put up their, um, um, their bylaws on data protection and guidance, you'll find that uh, when you go through uh, more of these uh, bills or these laws, you find that they are pure they a lot of uh, gaps uh, in terms of uh, uh, data and uh, personal data on farmers and both on their actually been documented uh, at the national level and uh, I think it's 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 also a role of these agribusinesses that these farmers provoke the government um, uh, uh, these bylaws on data protection about the farmers and it still goes back to to to, to the government because you know these governments here it's not until you provoke them that they will have to listen or to act on certain things. Uh, we've participated on these farmers. Uh, we've been, uh, for example, Igala, we've been participating uh, in putting up um, a national tea policy uh, to regulate the industry. But it, it's not until the private sector really provokes the government that it will have to come up and act. So the government has a slightly bigger role, but also the private sector has a slightly much bigger role uh, in putting things right for the smallholder farmers in terms of uh, code of conduct. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hamulus. Um, Andres? Um, I think that um, government involvement is a, is a great opportunity, and it also brings some challenges, right? The, the opportunity has to do with that um, point I had made earlier, that if we want um, certification and enforcement, um, uh, and, and we want them to not exclude the the smaller service providers, they, they need independent funding. And that's the sort of thing that governments can do, right? Run a, run a certification program, for example. Um, and, and that's great. The, uh, the, the challenge, I think, is, is like Hamlet was saying, which is that sometimes governments um, uh, either don't have the necessary people or have other priorities. and uh, might not be looking at all aspects of the problem, and and I I loved your your um, your your idea of provoking them, right? So 
you, <laughs> you, you, there you have that that the farmers associations and and the private sector should be, you know, engaged in and provoking them to get it right. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Andres. Um, so um, another question is. Um, uh, what uh, a code of conduct uh, should um, include? Uh, I mean, um, as a co as a context, um, some. Do you think um, if you were to let's say to uh, develop a code of conduct, uh, what would you include? Um, would it be some? I mean, definitions, farmers' rights. Um, consent what what features uh, would you uh, consider to include in in a farm data code uh, this goes to the three of you um, so <laughs> Stephen can you hear me yes 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 okay. I can go fast uh, Stephen, uh, and basically from farmers' perspective, if we want to be more practical, and this is the, the, the final question because uh, we are approaching at the end, but I think it's important one. So if we want to be more practical, we talked about codes of conduct, uh, what they are, what are the strengths, what are the, um, uh, the challenges, uh, why should we promote the idea of a code of conduct? But if we want to be more practical, um, what would you, let's say, include from a farmer's perspective uh, as building blocks, as features in a code of conduct? What would you like to be included so farmers could be more uh, secured? Thank Some you. Some suggestions. <laughs> yes. yes, thank you. For, thank you for that question. Uh, it's very interesting. Me as, a, as the farmer, this is what I want the code of conduct to have. Number one, it has to have the target audience. Who are the, the, the actual partners involved in this? The target audience. Two, I want it to uh, include what data exactly are we speaking about? Because we have very many categories of data on the farm. There is machine data, data from probably habits or finance, financial transactions. So it has to unpack that, what data exactly. And you know that data goes through a series of processes, processing, extraction, and now as it goes high up there, it's being aggregated. So all those levels should be clearly stated. At what level, me as a farmer, at what level do I have a right to create, read, update, and delete? Because I'm the primary source. So I, I, I want that to be captured in a code of conduct. What data? And how does it flow? And at what level am I able to access and do all those operations? Two, it has to clearly guide anyone who's coming to my farm, anyone who's providing a service to me. It should clearly state the, 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 the main core component of benefits and value. It's not about collecting and sharing, but what's the value? What am I gaining at the end? So it should clearly state that out. It should stand out. To anyone who's bringing who's bringing any kind of innovation to me or in a business to my farm wants to add value to me, that should be clearly stated as they're coming. Then the other point is about um, is about rights. Of course, yes, it should clearly state the rights, the security levels, and where is it going to be stored. You know, we use very many mobile apps, but I always question myself. I keep on saving all these transactions, all these things I sell, but I don't know who saves them. Why is the source? I'm not even sure when, um, what if my data is safe anyway. So all that should be clearly stated. And two, it should come with the consent, the consent form or letter that I should, you know, read through. It should be clearly stated in a simple language. I, I, I'm going to take myself to be like, I'm literal, I don't know English, so probably you who's coming should be able to interpret it, to put it in a local area that I can understand so that I know what I'm saying against. So it should be simple, precise, and clear, and straight to the point. And lastly, it's about uh, data sovereignty. That should be clearly stated. And the end point is, uh, um, I should be, 
uh, credited. Yeah, there should be some kind of, you know, appreciating. You know, you come, we do business together, you come up with a product at the end, you go make money, you leave me behind. So at least they should, you should credit me somewhere in your product X that, you know, Stefan, given firm X contributed to this app, he was participating in the pilot, you know, it gives me morale to encourage more farmers to join your platform to use it. So. I want to see myself placed in a position where I have um, strong say and, you know, something like that. That's what I think it should have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very helpful. Uh, so let's go to, to Hamlus. Hamlus, would you, what would you add, I would, I would ask? Besides uh, uh, Stephen's um, features? What would you add to, to have a balance of interests uh, between, let's say, agribusinesses and farmers? Or what would you also like to, to showcase to agribusinesses and ag tech providers to take into consideration concerning farmers? Let's say that you had this opportunity. Uh, what would you, your suggestions would be? Yeah, I will also speak on the perspective of uh, being a farmer. Uh, I think for over a century, uh, farmers uh, have not equally had any role in terms of what they do. And uh, all that has been happening is to wait for what really comes to them. And this is a point, and this is a time when we want to see when they have the demand and the right, and they say, every bit of the transaction or uh, any every fair chain or value chain we should look at a, a farmer provoking some say some right and um, uh, like Stephen is really saying this is a time when a farmer should look at certain things working for him or this very farmer, a local farmer, not certain things really working well, the processor or the business person or the researcher or a donor. So I think I would, I would urge you um, the basic promotion, a fair communication, fair sensitization, to let these people really understand what does it really help? How does it really benefit? And to suitable rates upon different other processes. of um, the recent works we are looking at government, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture guidelines and a feeling of certain... Yeah, and, yeah, I've lost my connection. Yeah, yeah I, I think I'm back. Yeah, now we can... Yeah. The connection was not so good, um, actually. Okay. And, 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 and the other thing is why should we really keep on promoting code of conduct? Um, for so many times, uh, uh, biz, big business guys have really taken advantage of these smallholder farmers. I'll give scenarios whereby there's, there's still a gap between a smallholder farmer and say an input uh, um, manufacturing company because of the middlemen. So this would be easily addressed uh, in the codes of conduct. And the other thing has been basically the validation. You know, you go collect data from the farmer and then you again um, think about this farmer when you want to validate. But when it is really big, parties, then suddenly it becomes more uh, easy for even the farmer. Hey, um, 
Thank you, Hamlus. Even though the connection was not so good, uh, thank you. I think we've, we've got the main points. Um, I left uh, last but not least the industry, okay. industry perspective, Andres. Um, we would like your input um, what a code of conduct uh, in agriculture uh, should include. Uh, so basically from the farmer's perspective, as mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some some um, different conflicting requirements, right? And um, uh, and and Stephen and, uh, laid out some really great um, points there uh, of things that that you want to get. Um, and 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 Hamlet added to that, um, which. I think, you know, at heart, you're trying to accommodate um, informed consent. So um, you want the farmer to know what's going to happen with their stuff. You know, why, why, why are you asking me for this? I'm, I'm busy. You're coming. You're taking my time. You're taking my information. What are you going to do with it? And what am I going to get out of it? You know, and and what is this going to be used for? Those are all very important things, and and um, they imply transparency, right? Mm -hmm. So that informed consent implies transparency, and this is a way of building enough trust that you, uh, as a farmer, can actually provide that data with confidence. But you know, this this um, isn't a perfect world, and uh, relations of trust can change. And I think that a code of conduct needs to accommodate the possibility that a farmer might decide that an actor that they've shared data with is no longer worthy of their trust, right? And that's mm -hmm. where we come to things um, like in GDPR, where you have the right to be forgotten, right? Mm -hmm. And when, when you have um, transactional data, Let's say as a uh, as an input manufacturer, right? Um, I can use f uh, farmer data, for example, to um, try to best um, uh, place a given crop variety. Like saying this crop variety really works best in these kinds of environments. So I'm going to try to set, prioritize my sales of this in those places where it's best. And I used certain uh, farmers' data from those places to, um, to arrive at that. And um, if, if a farmer, for, for whatever reason, decided that they don't want to collaborate with me anymore, um, well, they should have the right to tell me that I need to erase their data, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I should honor that, um, that request. Um, I can't, however, and sort of nobody can uh, realistically say, okay, I'm going to go and process all the aggregated data again uh, to remove the contributions of that individual farmer. Um, that's impractical. But what I can do is say, okay, I delete this farmer's original data, return it to them if they so requested, and use it anymore, right? It's the kind of of expectation that they should have. Um, the, the difficulty with this is that um, it's easy to get excited and be and start getting comprehensive, right? And saying, and rattle off points. I want to know exactly who's gonna get my data. I wanna know exactly what's gonna be done with it. I wanna know exactly um, this, that, and that, and that. And what you end up with is this very long and complicated code of conduct which has tension with the idea that we've mentioned repeatedly that we want to keep this simple, right? Yeah. So I think it's, and, and not only that, but when it happens in the context of changing technologies and changing business models, you know, you, you also get the, the danger of, of making a, a code that ends up by virtue of trying to be very detailed um, is immediately kind of obsolete. So in general, I think that it's better to prioritize 
some fundamental concepts. So, um, which, which I like about codes in general that they try to set up some shared values, right? So if you say you really have to be transparent um, with what you're going to do with the data and what the farmer gets out of it, you really need to um, uh, go out and get that informed consent and be you know, mindful of the fact that you might have literacy issues, you might have um, activity trap issues, right? Where somebody's just too busy to pay a lot of attention. So um, if you can, if we can um, sort of distill the fundamental concepts down to mm -hmm. something short that is clear for everybody, but that is worded specifically enough that um, it's clear what what it looks like when you're doing it right, I think we've we've done it properly. I totally agree with you. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Andres. Um, so uh, I would like only to add uh, something that um, uh, at Godan, in collaboration with uh, CTA, uh, we are developing an uh, online uh, tool about codes of conduct where um, someone who is interested in developing his or her own code of conduct could uh, go to this template and pick from specific uh, features, uh, exactly what you mentioned, um, address uh, previously, uh, we have specific uh, uh, features that we think that they are the most important ones. Of course, they might occur some, something else at the process, but um, we have uh, 14 uh, clauses. And from these 14 clauses that we think that they are basic, uh, each one could pick or could maybe select all of them to create uh, their own code of conduct. Uh, so this is an effort to see and document also um, what are the most important uh, clauses that should be included in a code of conduct. Uh, it's a good way of, uh, you know, um, valuing uh, what needs to be included in the codes of conduct. And also, uh, of course, raising awareness, uh, let's say, to farmers and farmers uh, organizations to have a more concrete idea about the codes of conduct and how they can further negotiate uh, with agribusinesses or ag tech providers. So the goal is also to raise awareness, empower um, uh, farmers around um, uh, codes of conduct or for better um, data management uh, practices. Um, so it will be launched uh, basically, I think, uh, by this month in April, and we'll let you know about this launch on online tool on codes of conduct from Gordon's website. Um, at this point, we have. Um, arrived at our end of this webinar. It took us longer than uh, the usual ones, but uh, uh, it was great having you all uh, here, the four presenters. I would like to thank you all. Um, Alisa Namoli Blazevic, uh, Steven Kaliazubula, Hamlus uh, Oyesiga, and Andres Ferreira. Thank you all for your time, for your insight. Um, it's been very, very helpful um, for the uh, Gordon community, but also, I think, for all the participants that had um, uh, the opportunity to attend. Thank you all. I would like to thank also the participants and I would also like to um, apologize for sometimes the connection, the internet connection was not so good, but I think it has to do um, with the current situation that the internet is quite busy uh, these days uh, in, in, in overall. Um, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, the, the panelists, um, much appreciated uh, your, uh, your input. Uh, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.